Okay, thank you all for being here. We're, what we're going to do right now is a, a special video. Uh, Brother Ryan had a great idea and some things we've been talking about in the past about uh, essential tools of Bible study. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do a quick overview of the four essential tools for proper Bible study. I wrote this. I wrote, the student of the Bible needs these four tools in his or her toolbox for proper Bible understanding. If you have these four essential tools, it'll be a great start in your edification in the scripture, okay? So, <clears throat> the number one tool in the toolbox of a Bible student, this is for Bible students, the number one tool in the toolbox is context. Context. Now, we're going to break context down to a couple of uh, different subsections. But context, and I, and, I, and I wrote this down, this particular definition of context. Context has to do, is defined as the words that are used with a certain word or phrase to help explain or give light to its meaning. I'll say that one more time. What context is, is the words that are used with a certain word or phrase to help explain or give light on its meaning. Okay, so we'll talk more about that. When you begin to study the Bible, the first thing you must always keep in mind is that every verse, every book, every passage in the Bible has a context. All right? Now, of context, that can be broken down to four pillars or four subsections. Okay? I'm just going to do A, B, C, and D. All right? And this will be on video so you can rewind and stuff. If you need to know more, just contact me. So with context, the first thing I want to show, so there's four, there's four subsections. I'm going to break A, B, C, D. The first thing we want to know with context is always, first and foremost, who's speaking and to whom, okay? Always starts there. So who the Bible writer or speaker is, so who's speaking? Who's speaking? Who's the speaker? And to whom is that speaker or writer writing to? Later, we're going to see there's a, 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 little, a third one, when. But right now, hold off on when, we'll, we'll come back. But right off the bat, when you open the Bible to Genesis chapter 1, <coughs> verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth, the first thing you need to know is who wrote that, that verse, and that was Moses. That's important. Moses has a particular job in scripture, and Moses wrote that, and he wrote it to and about, by the way, the nation of Israel. We're going to see that. So understand, you need to know that right off the bat. Find out who wrote it, and who is he writing to. You know, Moses writes the book, and most people know Moses wrote the law to Israel. Okay? All right. Then later we'll see when. The second pillar or subset to context, so I'll just put B, is... It, is it the um, what is the immediate or overall context? So I'll just say, with every context, there's an immediate and an overall context. And simply put, immediate is if you're looking at a verse, what are the verses directly surrounding that verse? And overall, it could be the chapter, it could be the book. Because even amongst that, particularly overall, you can look at the chapter. Sometimes different Bible writers in different chapters deal with different things. Even in the prophets of Israel, uh, God would be talking, woe to this nation over here, this Gentile nation, and that's my people, in this chapter. Then he's talking about another uh, nation. So the chapter and even uh, down to, what was the other thing I said? The book. So let me say the book and the chapter. Uh, Certain books have a certain theme, so it's the theme, the theme of the book, okay? It's all those things. But, but obviously, with immediate, immediate context, it has to do with the verses surrounding it. The verses which come before it and after it. In my studies, you'll see that I may take you to a verse, but we'll read some con get some context, some immediate context. And most of the time, I'll tell you, here's the overall context as I've already studied up. But you don't have to take my word for it. If you want to read... 50-something chapters of, you know, Jeremiah, go ahead. I, I say do it. 
I've done it, but so when I go on that verse like we did in our study earlier, Jeremiah 9 or whatever, Jeremiah 5, I've already read it and that's it. But we can at least look together at the uh, immediate. So that's our second pillar. Let me say this. Uh, immediate. What is being conveyed in the passage in the surrounding verses, as well as the entirety of the chapter or book, not only do the immediate surrounding verses influence a particular word or phrase, so just like the context, the immediate context actually influences. If we're in, if we're in uh, Jeremiah 9, verse 23, verse 22 and 24 have, have a part in what 23 is talking about and so forth, right? So not only do the immediate surrounding verses influence a particular word or phrase, that's the immediate context, but there is also a contextual influence, the overall context. And you factor in the presence of particular concepts that is repeated and so forth. So basically, it's just saying the overall context is know the book. Uh, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. So I already know he's going to talk to Israel as I read it about the destruction that's coming on Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. The next book Jeremiah wrote, Lamentations, is him lamenting about that destruction. So as I'm reading verses in Jeremiah and or Lamentation, for example, I know that that's the overall context of what Jeremiah is about. Okay? Another example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I just know right off after studying that Matthew shows Jesus Christ as Israel's Messiah. Uh-oh. Okay. Matthew is the king. Mark as the suffering servant. So things in Matthew that's recorded in Matthew will be consistent with showing him as the Messiah King. Things in Mark will be consistent with showing him as the suffering servant. By the way, in Mark, he doesn't have a pedigree, uh, pedigree um, genealogy. a genealogy. Mark just starts off, bam, Jesus Christ. He gets a growing. And this and that, straight away, straight away, because he's a servant. Matthew has genealogy going back to David and the son of David, the son of Abraham, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Mark, no genealogy, he's a servant. Can he work? Luke shows him as the magnificent man. His, his, his humanity, it goes all the way back to Adam. This is where you see him at 12 years old in the temple. It's not recording anywhere else. This is his humanity. So I know that's consistent with Luke. And the things that happen in John has to show him as Jehovah God, miracle, seven miracles before his death, one after, eight. Uh, it's futuristic in its nature. By the way, all the books of John are futuristic and so forth. Okay? So when I'm reading these passages in these books, when I go to Mark, I'm thinking, yep, so far serve consistent. That's why he records neither the Son in the book of Mark. There were some things that Jesus Christ did not know as the Son as he operated down here. That's recorded in Mark because he, he's, he's a servant. The servant knows not what his master doeth. Even that verse and other verses consistent with the book. Okay, everybody got that. All right. Any questions about that? Okay. Now, the third pillar or subset or C would be same word can have a different concept associated with it. So I'm going to say, yeah, I, I, we broke those up. Okay. So same word, say it like this, different meaning. And I'll give you some examples, okay? Same, same word, different meaning, okay? For example, the same word can be used to describe different concepts. Determined, by the way, by the context, the meaning of the word. For example, words like gospel. Gospel simply is gen a, gen a generic term for good news. But there's the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the uncircumcision. So when you hear the word gospel, don't always assume you hear people talk about the gospel. Most denominational brethren think gospel of the kingdom, the one Jesus Christ preached. But they mix and match that with the gospel of the grace of God given only to Paul. Just because it's the same word. Just because it's the word. So when I hear gospel, I automatically say, which gospel are you talking about? Because there's more than one gospel. When people say there's one more than one, when you say that there's more than one gospel, people get upset. Oh, there's only one gospel. I'm good news. No. I understand what they're thinking, but the word gospel in the Bible has different meanings depending on the context. If Paul and his epistles say the gospel, you can automatically assume he's talking about the gospel of grace. 
If Jesus Christ doing the earthly ministry says, preach the gospel, he's not talking about the gospel of grace, is he? He's talking about the gospel of the kingdom. So a word like gospel, baptism, oh boy. Most people, when they hear baptism, they think water. water. It's raining out here in California. We don't get a lot of rain. Water. Go out and baptize yourself. Sprinkle yourself. <laughs> Listen. But baptism means total identification. There's a spirit baptism. There's a baptism uh, of the spirit, by the spirit, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body in the body of Christ. There's John's baptism of water. There's different baptisms. Right, and different uh, baptizers. And, and different baptizers. So therefore right? it's a different baptism, right? Exactly. So I'm just these are just examples of how the same word can have a different meaning. Give, give you a couple more. Church. Stephen and Acts mentioned the church in the wilderness, wilderness, the church of Moses. The Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew and so forth mentions my church. To give Peter the keys of the kingdom and so forth and build my church. That's the messianic kingdom, the Messiah's church. That Moses eventually little flock. The little flock and so forth. They'll eventually become part of that. Then our Apostle Paul talks about the church, which is his body, right? Ephesians and Colossians and so forth, and 1 Corinthians and so forth. So even the word church has is the same word, different meaning. The body of Christ, so forth. Or even like uh, the house churches are different than the you body of what? Christ as a, as a church, including all the house churches. Exactly. Right? That's a good point, Ryan. Like with uh, a house Philemon, church. right? Paul might say the church which is in his house. In his house, right. We, we know they're members of the body of Christ, the church which is his body, it doesn't but... doesn't mean that only the body of Christ is only in that one person's house. Right. Church usually means a uh, called out assembly, mm -hmm. but it simply means assembly, right? A called out assembly. Assembly. There were members of the body meeting at this man's house, so it was the church in his house. Okay, everybody got that. A couple more. The word damnation. Paul uses the word damnation when referring to believers. He's not saying damnation of hell. Jesus Christ used that word damnation, says the damnation of hell. But every time you hear damnation, it doesn't mean hell. The context defines what it means. And if Paul is talking to believers, he's definitely not meaning hell. Condemnation, the same thing. And one big thing is the word suffer, because we deal with those, we're talking about suffering. As far as joint heirs in Romans 8, 17, we suffer with him. But Paul will also talk about suffering in 1 Corinthians 12, about members suffering one with another. So there's one particular suffering, suffering with our Lord Jesus Christ, and then there's others with other members of the body of Christ and so forth. Uh, Ryan had a good analogy about suffering. If you have pain in your physical body, you don't go to a psychologist or psychiatrist to deal with that pain. You go to a physician. Someone who can heal a physical infirmity. But if you have an emotional or mental suffering, which people do, it's just as real as physical suffering, it's just not talked about as much, it would be weird or strange to go to a doctor, a physical, a physician, up to the, now they can, you can talk to them about it, but what they'll do is they'll say, hey, go see a psychologist, go see a psychiatrist, uh, someone else who can deal with your inner suffering. I'll deal with your physical suffering. Really, and what they need to do is get in the Word. Well, that's what it is. That, that's, 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 that's what the really, secular world would yeah, say. That's not the secular world, right. That's what I mean. But if you understand that, there's a physical, so, you know. Uh, if you have physical sufferings, the Word of God will comfort your inner man. But, you know, if you got a, a wound, go ahead and get that stitched up with a physician, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if I got cut with a knife, I'm not going to psychology or anything. The word God will say, uh, go get that stitched up for your arm. The point is, is it's right. the same word suffering, same word, but it's a different kind of suffering. Different kind of suffering. And we know by the context. And suffering is not just this general thing. My, my emotional suffering is not the same thing as my physical suffering. It's just not a general, hey, it's just suffering. And, and we deal with that a lot because to suffer with Him, Christ, is in a different context of suffering with other members of the body of Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul's talking about the physical body anyway, you know. Talk about the physical pain that the body suffers, particularly as, a, as, a, as, a, as showing one with another. So the, the, the context determines that. All right, everybody got that? He is gospel with the doctrine, or is that separate? Say what now? Gospel with doctrine. Is that the same, or is that separated? Oh, does gospel and doctrine mean the same thing? It, it could. It could. Paul uses gospel in a couple different ways. He might be talking particularly about the gospel that will save you. But part of overall gospel of Paul, of Paul is the entirety of the doctrine. It, yes. could, it could be synonymous with the mystery. It could be synonymous with the mystery. 
Because the doctrine is like gospel, the really only because Moses had his doctrine or gospel, whichever you want. Uh, well, Moses, Moses taught about the, the coming of Messiah's well, kingdom. You know, what I'm trying to say is uh, that they you had, had you different, have to, different law, the different doctrines. Right. Whereas now we're in really great. That was all good news, but you'd have to determine who, again, back to the beginning, who was speaking and to whom. Right? Well, that's why I, I kind of think it kind of goes along with. Grace, uh, doctrine, and uh, gospel. It just depends on. Who oh, I see what you're saying. Now, now the word doctrine. Interesting enough. Thank you, John. The word doctrine is mentioned outside of Paul for other doctrine. Just means specific teaching. Uh -huh. That's what I'm trying to get at. It, it seems like it's kind of the same because it goes by different gospels, different doctrines. Oh, I see what you're saying. It, so, is the word doctrine used? Can you use it pretty much the same way as gospel? You can. Yes. It doesn't all, gospel and doctrine don't always mean the same. Again, the context will, just, will determine it for you. But you can. Sometimes when Paul talks about his gospel, he means the doctrine, the mystery doctrine, mm -hmm. the entirety of it. He'll just say, my gospel. The word of truth. The word of truth. Well, actually, I really don't see any other doctrine in the Bible other than uh, uh, Paul's. See, that's what I thought. But, but, but there is other doctrine in yeah. the Bible. Mm -hmm. Not Paul's doctrine. So I get what you're you saying now, Jim. The word doctrine, this actually is good because this is one of those things. The, if, when you see the word doctrine, it doesn't always mean Paul's doctrine. Because the Bible uses the word or term doctrine to describe other people's uh, messages as well. Specific teachings. Specific teachings as well. You get that? Like Moses. Uh, I, I kind of do, but I don't quite see it in that. Okay, I'll show you that. Old Testament compared yeah, I'll, I'll show you that. We'll just we're gonna look up doc, the word yeah. doctrine. It's in it's in the Old I Testament. Didn't need to. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. In fact, I quoted that passage from uh, uh, was it? I forgot who it was. He says, with, "With whom shall he? To whom shall he teach doctrine? They that are weaned off the press and so forth." I think it's Isaiah. But we'll see that. Thank you, Jim. Now, the last thing on context is this. This last subsection on context is this. Sorry, it's a little bit long. And Jim, I, you know what I'll do? I'm going to have you... It is Isaiah. Yeah, thank you. Jim, if you can get a, uh, another marker for me. Okay. Watch it. I'll just get this. I'll just finish it. Okay, so the, 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 the first tool is context, and we're just bringing it down. But in context, and you have to do this because context is this, is, is, is this involved, the same word with different meanings. And the last thing about context is... Uh, different words, different words, or different word, different words, same meaning. Okay, I, I'll give you examples of that. Same meaning. All right. Thank you, Jim. All right, so Jim, our last one about so our first our first tool is context. You always have to start there, but then there are pillars broken down in four pillars under context or subsets. Who's the speaker and to whom? Always got to find out who that is first. Then, once you narrow that down, you then narrow down the whatever the verse or passage, you look at the immediate context, what, what the verses before and after it, and then the overall, the book and so forth, and the theme of the book and so forth. Or the concepts, right? Is it talking about the judgment seat of Christ? Well, okay. yeah. I know other things about the, the judgment seat of Christ, so I can apply that to what's being spoken here, yeah. here too. judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. Or the, the catching away in the, in the rapture. You exactly. It, right? I mean, there's so many. I mean, yeah. It just it, you could go on and on because yeah, exactly. These things. This is like the the most important things right here. Context and these things. Mm -hmm. The same word and different meaning we went through. Now, the fourth one is different word or same meaning or concept. Pretty much like synonyms we would think of. These are these are words, different words that can be used to describe the same concept, determined by the context, right? For example, we mentioned the word suffer, right? But suffer in the Bible, Paul also used other words to describe suffer. He talks about trials. He talks about afflictions. He talks about persecutions and tribulations. So those five words, for example, suffer, trial, affliction, persecution, tribulation, they're different words, but they have the same concept, similar meanings, right? And, and, and you, it'll be determined by the context, but they have a similar uh, concept to them. Yeah, Paul is not uh, forbidden to use synonyms, as right. some people might want to say. Yeah, he's not. Everybody uses synonyms. Yeah. Right. Well, let me give you a couple more. 
The word justify, when it's used in the Bible, is also used for righteous. So sometimes Paul or the writer will use the word justify, but ju it's just as well, because justify and righteous have similar meanings. It's the same meaning. So he'll use justify sometimes, or he'll use righteous. Another way, love and charity. Mm -hmm. We always talk about the, the, the work of faith, the labor of love. That's 1 Thessalonians 1. But Paul also says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, not work of faith, labor of love. He says, your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of each of you, right? Love and charity. And if you can go and go look at the Greek, the, 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 the word... The word for love is sometimes uh, translated as love or charity. So it's in the but but just the just the English word, love and charity in the Bible are different words with the same concept. I'll give you another one: condemnation. Different levels too. Different levels. That's right. Condemnation and damnation. Always defined by the context, but those words are very similar in Scripture. I, I like this one. We were just looking at this in Ephesians. Pastor and shepherd. Some pastors, Ephesians 4.11, that Greek word behind it is translated everywhere else as a shepherd. You can even throw bishop and overseer. Same thing. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be that the Greek word is the right. same either. No, that's exactly right. Different, different, different Greek words. Different Greek words. principle still stands. The same principle. Good point about that. Whether it's Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, then, right. then yeah. it, the principle still stands. Yep. You can have different words which have the same meaning. Synonyms are in any language. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Synonyms in any language. Okay. So that took the most, but that's the first pillar. So of the four tools that are essential for proper Bible study, the number one overall, number one draft pick, context. Everybody got that, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get to the other two. Oh, excuse me, the other three. Pardon me. All right. 